And so what we're going to say about the tensile strength of rock is that it's relatively unimportant compared to compressive strength, and that's why we don't spend a lot of time talking about it. And the reasons for it is it's comparatively low compared to the compressive strength. Also, whenever we consider a large enough rock volume, which when we deal with reservoirs, we're almost always considering large rock volumes, right? Um, you know, even when we do a computational simulation where, uh, you know, one, say, finite element or one cell in, in the discretization, uh, you know, where if we're doing some, something like metals plasticity, we might use that one, that characteristic length of a cell could be on the order of sub-millimeters, right? But when we're modeling a reservoir, the characteristic length of a cell, when we do the computation, could be on the order of tens of meters to, you know, hundreds of meters, this kind of characteristic length. And so that's sort of this, the, the size of the characteristic volume of rock that we're saying is represented by this one cell in the computation. And in that case, a characteristic volume of rock that size is, is virtually guaranteed to have flaws in it. And in the case where you have flaws, rocks actually have very little to basically zero tensile strength. Because if you pull on them, you're just going to activate those flaws and the, and the rock's going to fracture almost immediately. And the third reason that we don't really care that much about tensile stress in terms of geomechanics is that there's really not any in the Earth. That's not to say that there's zero. I mean, it's very likely uh, that in, in areas near faults and other things, you can, you can, due to friction, you can get some tensile stress. Uh, but, you know, due to just the, the, the uh, plate tectonics or the in situ stress, they're, they're never tensile. Uh, so the one case, and we'll talk about hydraulic fracture in, you know, we'll, we'll basically have a whole lesson on it later in the class, but uh, the one kind of scenario which you might think about tensile is in terms of hydraulic fracture. So in that case, we either purposely inject fluid into the rock, and then the pore pressure can exceed the principle. So that we inject fluid, increasing the pore pressure, and that can exceed the minimum stress, the minimum principal stress, whichever one that may be, SH min, SH max, or SV. Once we exceed that stress, now we have a state of tension, local tension, right, right, right there at the crack, and that can cause the crack to propagate. Well, because we're assuming there's a crack there, now we get into the realm of fracture mechanics, because We don't really have a way in terms of stress of dealing with the tip of a crack, right? Because if you remember, stress is proportional to strain. And strain, mathematically, is a partial derivative with respect to space of displacement, right? So you have like strain, remember, in 1D, and that's all we need to demonstrate the point, is partial U, partial X where U is displacement. So if we're displacing if we're displacing a solid body and we need to evaluate this partial derivative, at the tip of a crack, mathematically the tip of a crack represents a discontinuity in displacement. It's a singularity there, right? So in fact, this derivative is undefined and therefore we can't really talk about stress because we, you know, stress is proportional to strain and strain is undefined. Therefore, stress is undefined or it's singular at the tip of a crack. So in order to account for that, this whole branch of mechanics called fracture mechanics what came around around the 1900s and was really more formalized in the 30s and, well, in during World War II, especially became very important with airplanes. Uh, to understand how cracks are going to grow uh, due to fatigue in an aircraft, right? <clears throat> so uh, this whole fracture mechanics aspect came about, 
And in fracture mechanics, we, we, have, we account for the singularity at the crack tip through something called a stress intensity factor. And that's, we typically call it K. And for opening mode, mode one is, is in terms of fracture mechanics. So usually you talk about three modes. You have an opening mode, uh, a, a shearing mode, that's mode two, and then like a, a tearing mode, that's mode three. Okay. So mode one is opening. It's associated with tension. So we, we denote the stress intensity factor associated with this mode one opening. right? And this is a way to account for the singularity. And in, in a semi-infinite body or in an infinite body subject to a constant pressure where you have a crack, an elliptical crack, uh, subject to a constant <coughs> pressure, then the equation for the stress intensity factor is this. And here we've included the effect, you know, we've, we've broken down. Normally just, I mean, this is effective stress out front, right? But it's, it's the pore pressure minus the minimum principal stress. And you can see it's proportional to the square root of length, okay? And so whenever the stress intensity factor exceeds some critical value, and that critical value is a material property. So you can think of it just like Young's modulus, E, or Poisson ratio, nu. The stress intensity, the, the, critical, the critical value of stress intensity factor, which we call the fracture toughness, this is K1C. The fracture toughness of the material is a material property. So whenever the stress intensity factor exceeds the critical value, the crack will grow, okay? And so here's a plot schematically of two different materials. One has a very high fracture toughness. This would be a sandstone, some types of sandstone or, or dolomite, and a weak sandstone, right? And so what, the point of this is uh, this is a plot of the this is a plot of the effective stress here versus fracture length. And what you see is that at very short fracture lengths, there's a quite a difference in the effective stress that will cause the crack to propagate. So this is what we call like a toughness dominated regime. So in the, in the early stages when the crack length is short, we're in a toughness dominated scenario. And this is really what it takes for the crack to initiate and begin to propagate. Okay? And in that case, the fracture toughness matters a lot because, as indicated by the large difference in pore pressure. Okay? But because you have this square root of length term in the equation, as the length gets longer, the difference decays asymptotically, such that at very long lengths, there's no difference. And basically what this means is that the for very long cracks, the fracture toughness of the material doesn't matter. Uh, relatively doesn't matter. Right? So it, it doesn't matter if you have a very high fracture toughness material or a very low fracture toughness material. The amount of pore pressure, that, the amount of pressure in the, in the fracture that will cause it to propagate uh, will be roughly the same for long fracture lengths. Okay.